convene the meeting in Kampala. On this same topic, and we spent three days on this with a, a, a good cross-section of stakeholders from Africa and abroad. And you will access the outcome of this meeting in our website. Some of you have got it on our emails already. And the question which we asked was, since independence, 60 years ago, what worked well, what did not work well? How come that the South Asian countries who got independent same time with us, Singapore, South Korea, Malaysia, are now donors to us? What happened? So here are some of the messages which came out of that meeting. It is all about governance. Governance, governance, leadership, accountability. Africa is lagging behind. You heard the, the keynote speaker earlier today. In all indices, and the gap is big between us and other regions. We felt shame about this. And some of the participants listening to our keynote speakers were seen shedding tears, feeling bad. Is that what we should be doing? And we are now here in Africa, and the Africa Health, our third year of life, we are growing, and we really need to be the ones now who will be the drivers of change. We have the opportunity of the SDGs. We invited it to the opportunity of independence. The Africans who led the independence movement, the Krumans, they were ambitious, they were self-confident. And they were telling us they would bring Africa of disease, poverty, and ignorance. It didn't happen. We need to get that mindset back. And things sometimes go so bad where we are, and we accept them as normal. And it is we, African health type of people, very highly educated people, very capable people, often in positions of leadership, but we accept to live with the intolerable. Why is Africa lagging behind when there are people like you and me? This is the message which I would like to encourage or to call upon African health to become the change agent that it, it, it must be. Education and training, research, that is the foundation of the people who will become the change agents. Can Africa Health take up this role to play the role of change agents? It is upon each one of us, one by one, to commit ourselves to this mission. Sort of how you join a religion or something like that. You decide inside, alone in your heart, is this something that I am touched about, that I care about. And then you become, as an individual and as a collective, uh, a driver of this. I also have a call to our partners. We are very privileged and very fortunate that the U.S. government, through BEPFA, USA, NIH, etc., have given us this support since maybe maybe. And there are others who have achieved a combined common vision. And I'll tell you as I conclude the short story of the, the king of the kingdom of Uganda in Uganda. In 1875, some white people started to come there looking for the source of the river Nile. And they heard about the king there. They went to the king and they had several meetings with him and told him they have many things. They have machines which carry people. They have this in the, the king's letter, Queen Victoria, so many decades ago. People of good character. So these are people who actually the queen said, the first doctor is, now you hear about Makerere, Great Makerere, that man led to the Great Makerere. And there were other Great Makerere expatriates 
who brought us up, people who cared and believed in Africans achieving their goals themselves. The thing is to call upon us, we African professionals through Africa, Afri Health, to become change agents in this continent, to be felt to be and much to live with the children. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Insightful. The next is is a person, Dr. Isaac Adamoy, an oncologist, and an NIH grantee, a former NIH grantee. So on all of those counts, Professor Adamoy, tell us what we can learn about governance and leadership from your experience. At this uh, round table discussion with uh, a straight table. <laughs> I think, um, it, just like the governor said, uh, he's been instructive listening to quite a number of presentations today. Uh, but one thing is clearly missing from all the presentations, and that is the role of leadership and governance in order to do. I have gone through governors and government, we will not go far except they describe health as a political choice. And in that presentation, he called for highest political commitment at all national levels. And to me, that, that is critical. When you look at what we've been doing, uh, Africa Health has a broad mandate to partner with ministries of health academic institutions and well stakeholders, that's what is in your brief. But when you look at this country, I can already see Ministry of Health here. Yeah. So something is based on the world becoming a, a small village because of your transportation and there are quite a, many other things. And, and what is also current, even at global level, is that there will be another epidemic. And people are calling the epidemic epidemic X. What we do not know is the nature of that epidemic, where it will occur and when. So we need to be prepared for this next epidemic. But to get prepared for this next epidemic, there must be re-cooperation among nations, among leadership. We must also strengthen respect to resource allocation. We won't go far in Africa, that is trying to touch on the presentation by Francis. We have depended too often on donor support. And for Africa to make a change, for Africa to improve, there must be domestic resource mobilization. A situation in which 95% of the funding for HIV comes from outside Nigeria is, to me, is not sustainable development. So we need to change the narrative. We need to improve our domestic resource mobilization. And we need to go beyond political commitment on they call it leadership program for health ministers. And part of what we were taught at that meeting is how to change the narrative, how to speak to those who divide the cake. Because it is one thing for you to be health minister, it is another thing for you to get the resources that you require. You need to speak the language that the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Budget will appreciate. Things like mortality and so on. There are a lot of interest to ministers of finance. What would be of interest to them is to talking about transparency, about cost saving, and talking about return on investment. I think for so for so long the World Bank, of the World Bank apologized for misleading African leaders into believing that they need to invest in infrastructure. The return on investment on infrastructure is at best when you invest one dollar, what you get at best is three dollars. When you invest $1 on TV program, you get $85. When you invest $1 on immunization, you get as much as $16 or up to $44. Save for family plan. So we need to change the narrative that health can actually open the door for sustainable development beyond those developments in health to economic education. So I think the narrative must change. We need to ask for improvement in domestic resource mobilization. We need to speak the right language and we need to partner with government. That would be my message to this group that we cannot go it all alone and we cannot expect foreign donors to continue to put in money. 
we must look for our money. And that money can come from tobacco, as in China, by, by taxing tobacco products. A lot of money came from the tobacco sector in China. So we can put tax on tobacco. In Nigeria, I think we've started, where we have a three-year program on taxing tobacco recognition that no one will sell tobacco in sticks, secret. You have to buy in packets. I, I, I think taxes for tobacco can also help them. And many other things. So we, we need to really look in what's and recognize the role of leadership and government. And that will extend to domestic resource organizations. And that is the only situation when, when things can change uh, within the context of Africa. Uh, I think uh, I want to stop uh, by saying that Ebola is still with us. With what is happening in DRC, it's not over. And any of our countries. <laughs> Is a professor of family. Oh, leadership. Please say something else about leadership. How did I come into Ever So I just want to give you a few words from my personal journey and a little bit of motivation for the people in the room. And forgive me with a special emphasis on the woman. You, you will in your in your everyday life, by whatever you do, you will know that what you do is know what each and every one does. You need to understand what they do. And then you have to look at the whole. That is why some people who are generalists are more inclined to become leaders because the specialists go deeper into the technical field, which is good, which is where they belong. So what are some other elements of leaders? I have a personal motto that I never give up relentless perseverance. Now that is that is a strength, it's also a weakness because sometimes it does not help to be stubborn. Sometimes it helps to be stubborn. I just want to motivate you in your work each and every day. If it doesn't work, try again in a different way. Do not be scared of making persevere. People centeredness, okay, I am a family physician, so I have to first to talk about people centered, but it's the people, it's not about me, it's about the people in the team that I'm working with. If you really care about what, what is important for them, why they are here, why they are doing it, then you take them with you as a team. You are not like, a leader is not something special, I'm not something special that you are not. We are all special, we are all working in teams, in certain conditions, yes. it is we that it is. And I like this, this refrain that's going, leave no one behind, because everyone is important. Great. Next, I want to introduce Professor Shave Ogasola. She is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research. She's an outstanding academic in infectious disease and microbiology. Um, I think I want to talk on leadership and global health in the sense of, from a female point of view, leadership from the female point of view. Um, before I was Deputy Vice Chancellor, I was the first female provost in my College of Medicine for 30, in, in its 50 years of existence, I was provost. And I realized at that time, I didn't think I wanted to be a provost. I didn't want to be, I had to be convinced in the initial to even go forward. And I, and in taking the position, I asked myself, why did I as a woman not want to be the leader of the medical school? Because it was very instructive. I'll just give a little background. I didn't grow up in a family that differentiated women from men. So it, it, it wasn't because I had been put down. I grew up in a family where I was affirmed. I went to school, we did the same things with boys, not wanting to move forward unless they're 150% sure that they can do it. And that for men, it was 30% and I said, I'm good at it. <laughs> and I, I, I thought about it and I said that because I thought, I can't do it. And someone said, why not? You've done this, you've done that, you've done that, you've done that, you've done, you can do it. But I, I kept feeling
feeling I couldn't. And so when we talk about women being put down, I can say for a fact myself, I said politics is about the, how you harness people and bring them together to work, how you work with different kinds of people, even those that don't have a point of view. I said that's what we do as women all the time, at work, at home, with your family, with your in-laws, we're all politicians. So I said, that's okay. I'm a politician, but in the best possible kind of way. I was to retire there. So they were old men. So I didn't fit the mood. And I thought, well, I'm going to go anyway. And I'll just be myself. And do it the way I know how. That's worked for me. And so what I'm trying to say here is leadership is, a, is about service and about being your best self. So you're going to use the talents that you have to serve those coming. Since 2003, with two wonderful people from Harvard and Northwestern, and I've wondered what has sustained that partnership. I think it's a, a, a commonality of vision. It's about being true to who we are. It's about the fact that you can be trusted, integrity. And I, and I also believe that as Africa moves forward, we have to in our values. I think one of the greatest problems we still live with is the problems of col colonialism, in the sense that we, we keep trying to be more like the global north. We have a lot of lessons and a lot of knowledge in here. And more and more as I've grown, I've learned to value the value of Africans. And I think <laughs> as we partner with the North, because we can learn a lot in terms of technology and so on, but we have a lot of indigenous tech, like, recognize the things we have and start working on that. And that's why we have universities. Because that's what we're supposed to do. What works and what works for us and how do we make it better? And we partner with our friends to help us along the way. So that's the message I have today. We have to be authentic. We have to forgive ourselves where we don't do so well. But let's leave that and keep moving forward. And let's have so much more to us than the problems. And I think we need to celebrate ourselves. Thank you very much. And how we will do a good job of it. So, thank you. Um, the next speaker is going to be Professor Peter Odoko, emergency physicians, emergency nurses in, in Ghana. So, Professor Odoko. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Donko and Odoko are different names. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you are, you are my sister, so I can correct you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, years ago, when I met a couple of some Nigerian friends, I said, Oh, you Ghanaians, you did very well. Uh, especially when uh, your former president, Jay Rollins, lined up all these corrupt politicians and killed them. Uh, we should be doing the same thing. I said, You really want to do that? Uh, anyway, uh, the truth is that currently in Ghana, uh, the, the person who complains most about those who succeeded him uh, in his own party is Jerry John Rollins. Last, last, last point I want to make is that uh, as AfriHealth, we are AfriHealth, AfriHealth, we have to invest in developing accountable leadership across the whole continent in the health arena. Uh, and in so doing, we ensure that transition within our institutions, both in our universities, in our hospitals, and even those who may venture into politics. Great. And Shana, you were very articulate about the importance of, of women in leadership roles. How can we increase the presence of women in leadership roles uh, here in Nigeria or through the African health system? You know, I, I can just tell you that at NIH we've had a uh, new policy where neither Francis Collins nor I or some of the leaders can
can be on a panel that doesn't have women. women. We call them an all-man panel a man. Um, the idea of not good enough. We're very, we, we, we second guess ourselves very much. Secondly, the idea that um, you, when you look around and in the political space or leadership space, there's a lot of uh, how do you cope with bad publicity? Women don't like that, but it's something we have to get used to. You can't be in leadership and bad things will be said about you, true or untrue. So it's for us to continue to mentor women deliberately and allow them to flourish. Um, I, I, that's the, those are the two things. Mentoring. We need a lot of mentoring of young and more people being courageous to come out. Um, what I tell people is, do it anyway. You'll be scared, but everybody's scared. So do it anyway, whether you're scared or not. So you start, you're scared, then you get used to it, then you push the envelope a little every time. And soon you don't even know where you moved from. How can Africa contribute to, to one, strengthening systems, but secondly, um, growing new leaders? I've been attention to the basic tenets of how societies are run. Uh, and, and I believe that respecting basic human rights is one, but we do that through the young people who we interact with. Uh, and the young people who we, many of us are trainers, who we teach, who sometimes we cannot even ask us, uh, as was pointed out by uh, my sister or prof, that uh, we go, we, all of you did. That. What's the difference between Mrs. in the air and those sitting down there? There's no, no, no difference. I just have the opportunity to sit here and pontificate to you. And it is how the commitment to the common good is manifested. So like Africa Health is doing, as an institution, we must build the correct systems there, manuals, financial management, human resources management, etc., etc., and then follow religiously and be accountable. But it is you and me as the individuals who will either follow those manuals or pray. Them. And it is our commitment to the common good. Question. Uh, is that uh, I've been wondering about how we should attain what we want to attain as the by 2050. Now, if you guys study this, you all know that nations that have good capital income have good percentages. Nations that have poor capital income have poor we will not only those who accumulate the money, and it is the reason why we have all these problems of Brexit and the others also. So the message for us now would be, yes, we must work with our government, as Isaac says, governments are very important. But the message we give to the governments is that invest in people, obviously the African demographic dividend, invest in education, invest in health, in social that contribution. Professor Bible's proposition is actually the proposition of our political leaders in Africa, believing that they must invest in the economy, in the infrastructure, in order for us to develop. But again, it's not working. It has not worked. And for Nigeria, it took Bill Gates to speak to the national parliament that we must invest in our people. And so the new shift is investing people uh, for the economy and infrastructure. So it's quite important that we <laughs> And I made mention of the situation in Thailand and Malaysia. They had improvement in their health indicators before recording socioeconomic improvement. So it's important that we need to invest in our people. Healthy people will be on the farm. Healthy people will drive the machine. Healthy people will drive the economy. Sick people cannot drive any economy. Thank you.
how can we, and I think that the minister can help us with this, how can we begin to train ourselves and our mentees and the generations coming after in how to understand how policy is actually um, brought to birth, how to navigate that last, possibly that last bottleneck of getting political will to implement the policies that we help the government. We need to now press for political commitment and action. But the only way to get it done, from my experience, is that we need to work with the National Assembly. No matter what grammar we speak, if you do not have the buying of the National Assembly, nothing will happen. Because it's, it's one thing for government to make budgetary provisions. It's another thing for National Assembly to retain that provision. And quite often, what comes out of the National Assembly is different from what you submitted. Fortunately, there are not many of us in the National Assembly. Embrace, we need to dialogue with them, we need to partner with them. Uh, and so take this conversation out of continental hotel because I think it will be able to make it back. Thank you. Thank you for informative. They've given us ideas about uh, speaking to power, uh, to get our, our viewpoints heard, to think about the importance of engaging everyone in global health dialogue, of reaching out to the community, of thinking about interprofessional education as we go forward. So there's a lot, there's a lot of risk in this bill to discuss and we have the next two days to cover these topics and, um, and discuss and come up with some solutions. Thank you all for joining us. This has been an amazing group of people. Thank you, Otoko, my co-host. And we'll adjourn now until the next session. Thank you. Give them a The last one. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh